7 Best Cars of 2021, with great performance and appearance. Auto Car Day Choice. 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E Review, the Android to Tesla's iPhone. But before we start, please support us by pressing the like and subscribe buttons, so that we can continue to provide information about car and motorcycle news. Also turn on the bell button to get the latest updates. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you. A few months ago I switched to an Android phone after being a lifelong iPhone user, a move that rocked the foundation of my inner circle. Honestly, all I wanted was a smartphone that was better looking and fun to use, while offering more features. And while there are some things I do miss, RIP iMessage, the overall experience feels more satisfying. That's how I felt after a week in the new Ford Mustang Mach-E. If Tesla is the apple of EV makers, with its closed-loop charging infrastructure and minimalist design language, the Mustang Mach-E feels like the best Android alternative, and it's the one I'd buy. What the NACTOY winning Mach-E offers more of than any other EV in its class is personality. This is not an appliance, not even close. Ford smartly used the iconic pony car nameplate to inject some life into its first true mass-market EV, which also blends superior driving dynamics, impossibly good looks, and a few honest-to-goodness muscle car characteristics. As with any good Android product, the Mach-E does have its quirks. Ford clearly still has some ironing out to do in regards to its massive user interface, and there are some interior bits that feel too much like the old Ford. But those are minor in the larger scope. The bottom line is the Ford Mustang Mach-E is a phenomenal EV. The Ford Mustang Mach-E does not look like a muscle car, but there are obvious comparisons to draw with the traditional Mustang Coupe, like the aggressively downturned headlights and the sloping hoodline. Even the grille, which is just sheet metal surrounded by black plastic, looks muscle car-esque in an odd way. The backside of the Mach-E represents a stark contrast. Other than the triple-bar taillight fixtures, you won't find much here to compare to the Mustang Coupe, since it's a crossover. The sloping roofline, finished in metallic black on this first edition model, blends almost seamlessly into an embedded spoiler, affording the Mach-E its sporty shape. There is some unique detailing just below the trunk lid too, but the shiny black stuff lower down on the bumper isn't great. This particular Mach-E wears one of the best paint color options available today, Grabber Blue Metallic. This was a no-cost option on the first edition model tested here, which is already sold out, and we haven't seen it on any other trims yet except the range-topping GT Performance model, not due to arrive until mid-year. This Mach-E also gets exclusive 19-inch directional wheels finished in bright silver with black inserts that really hammer the performance theme home. Pop open the doors, using the needlessly complicated button and pull tab combo, and the inside of the Mach-E looks unlike any other Mustang, for the most part. Greeting you when you open the door is a massive 15.5-inch vertical touchscreen and an adjacent digital instrument cluster screen, and that's about it. The dash design is simple and clean, with nice materials like ActiveX, faux stitched leather, smart speaker style fabric, and a faux carbon silver texture that isn't anywhere near as offensive as standard hard plastic. The knurled gear shifter could feel more premium and the volume dial could be sturdier, plus there's a healthy amount of piano black plastic, which is a fingerprint magnet. Otherwise, the inside of the Mach-E is leaps and bounds better than what you get on regular Mustangs and feels properly premium.
Thanks for watching. Drop a like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to watch more videos like this. Twenty twenty one GMC Sierra Denali fifteen hundred review, brainier and brawnier. But before we start, please support us by pressing the like and subscribe buttons, so that we can continue to provide information about car and motorcycle news. Also turn on the bell button to get the latest updates. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you. This generation of the GMC Sierra debuted in 2018 with unique features like the Multi-Pro tailgate, class-exclusive towing cameras, and a bevy of active safety equipment. For 2021, those same elements carry over plus a few new ones, the most notable being the Carbon Pro package. The $1,070 Carbon Pro package, as its name implies, adds a carbon composite inner bed to the Denali and AT4 models. The extra strong material gives the GMC Sierra one of the toughest beds in the class, plus appropriate badging on the front and rear fenders for bragging rights. But GMC still markets the Sierra as the only premium, half-ton truck on the market, and that feels disingenuous in 2021, given the range-topping options from Ford and Ram. The Sierra lacks high-quality cabin materials, some of its technology is sub-par, and its performance in some areas important to truck owners is below average for the class. And with that, GMC still asks a premium price, our truck costs $72,360 as tested. Even when this Sierra debuted a few years back, we found the design garish. And nothing really changes for 2021. The massive chrome grille still takes up a ton of real estate on the front end. The chrome fog light surrounds add more shiny elements that we don't like, and guess what, there's more chrome lower down on the bumper. At least with the Carbon Pro package, a $1,070 option, the Sierra sheds its standard shiny, high-spoked wheels for a slick 22-inch gloss black set, $2,995. Otherwise, the body looks generic. There's nothing unique or innovative in its sheet metal that helps the Sierra stand out alongside its sibling, the Chevrolet Silverado, or even the latest Ford F-150. In the rear, at least, there's a large GMC badge perched atop the tailgate so you don't get it confused with other trucks. The inside of the GMC Sierra is where things really start unraveling for this truck visually. Very little about the inside of this truck feels premium. There are some nicer aluminum finishes on the steering wheel and dash, but otherwise, it's obvious this is a copy and paste job from the more workmanlike Silverado. The Sierra has the same 8.0-inch touchscreen as the Chevy, similar low-quality plastic materials, and the same general layout. We expect more from a so-called premium truck in 2021. The Sierra Crew Cab, like a lot of half-ton trucks, offers generous amounts of passenger space inside. Those seated in the first row have 43.0 inches of headroom and 44.5 inches of legroom, more than what you get in the new F-150 Super Crew, 40.8, 43.9 inches. The Sierra's second row, meanwhile, has 39.8 inches of headroom and a solid 35.2 inches of legroom. The seats in both rows of the Denali model wear a no-cost jet black leather that's supple, and both buckets are heated and cooled in the front row. 
Pair those comfy seats with sublime sound deadening and a likable on-road demeanor, and the GMC Sierra makes for a comfortable way to toil away hours of highway driving. What makes this particular Sierra so cushy is the Denali Premium Suspension with Adaptive Dampers, which is one of the few premium features on this truck. Thanks for watching. Drop a like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to watch more videos like this.
2021 Honda Pilot Review. But before we start, please support us by pressing the like and subscribe buttons, so that we can continue to provide information about car and motorcycle news. Also turn on the bell button to get the latest updates. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you. Blackout packages are common in the auto industry these days, and it's pretty easy to understand why. Consumers think that murdered out badges and dark, glossy mirror caps and wheels look neat. Automakers, meanwhile, can use these low-cost touches to add $500 to $1,000 to each vehicle's transaction price, less money than an owner would spend on such aftermarket modifications. Everyone wins. The 2021 Honda Pilot Black Edition takes that approach but comes in at a slightly different angle. Yes, the wheels are black, as are the grille, mirror caps, and badges. It ticks the usual boxes. But it's also the range-topping version of Honda's three-row CUV. The company's decision to base the Pilot Black Edition on the $48,720 Elite trim only is a peculiar one, although that business decision doesn't change the fact that this big crossover remains an easy choice for families on the go. If you're blissfully unaware that this is the priciest Pilot on the market, the Black Edition touches are fine. But as we know it's the ritziest version, Honda's formulaic approach to tweaking the exterior is disappointing. Everyone is doing blacked-out wheels and chrome-free grills. What about a two-tone design, Honda? What about painting the wheel arches black? Instead of such flair, we get awkward, black edition, badging at both ends of the car and broadly unchanged styling overall. The pilot could desperately use some panache. The exterior, last updated in 2019, is attractive enough, but it's not exactly interesting, clean body lines conspire with a smooth front end and a squared off tail so that the pilot definitely looks like some kind of crossover. But when Hyundai, Kia, and now Nissan are adding Seoul to their three-row flagships, this Honda appears staid and conservative. There may be some good news on the horizon, at least. That's true of the unfussy cabin too. Finished with a reliance on, you guessed it, black materials. This range topping model adds red stitching and piping and flashier seat inserts. Still, the dash is an uninspiring sight if you've spent any time in the newer competition. That said, the interior quality is high overall, giving the Pilot a sturdy and refined cabin that owners should appreciate. While folks buy a Pilot for the second and third row, it's worth mentioning that the front seats do a fine enough job. They're wide and flat, lacking support for the lower legs especially although there's enough padding overall that we'd be content on a longer journey. The seating position itself is upright and feels proper for a large crossover, with good sightlines providing a commanding view. The second row, though, is the better place to be, with the Black Edition offering twin captain's chairs as standard. These seats provide better support than the front seats and more space, too. The third row bench is merely okay. Your 6'2 author made it back there with knees planted firmly in the chest. It should go without saying that road tripping in the fetal position is no fun, so reserve the last row for the kiddies. If ultimate space is your priority, the pilot is difficult to recommend, though. Break out the tape measure and you'll find just 38.4 inches of second row legroom, or less than the Ford Explorer, 39.0, Toyota Highlander, 41.0, Kia Telluride, 42.4, and Hyundai Palisade, 42.4.
Thanks for watching. Drop a like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to watch more videos like this. Twenty twenty one Mercedes Maybach GLS six hundred review, Diamond Lipstick. But before we start, please support us by pressing the like and subscribe buttons, so that we can continue to provide information about car and motorcycle news. Also turn on the bell button to get the latest updates. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you. Just hearing the word, Maybach, instantly transports me to a star-studded red carpet event or a glitzy music video brimming with champagne and beautiful people. The brand's revival in 1997 via the 57 concept established Maybach as the last word in German luxury, and it's essentially maintained that status on and off over the past 25 years. The 2021 Mercedes Maybach GLS 600 marks a new era for the iconic brand as Maybach's first crossover. Taking the fight directly to fellow relative newcomers like the Rolls-Royce Cullinan and Bentley Bentayga, both already booming with sales, the Maybach GLS needs to be more than just a Mercedes-Benz on steroids to stand out. And it both is and isn't. Chrome features catch your eye before even stepping inside of the Maybach GLS, while upscale options like rear recliners and a champagne fridge adorn the cabin. There's even a Maybach-specific drive mode that makes the large SUV feel even more cloud-like on the road. All of it lends credence to the SUV's six-figure starting price. The Maybach GLS costs $160,500 out of the gate. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's still too much GLS in this vehicle's DNA. Exceptional levels of comfort, safety, and technology give the Maybach GLS its impressive score, in fact, it's the highest rated SUV we've driven to date. But the clearly visible GLS bones, in contrast to the ground-up Rolls-Royce and Bentley alternatives, sort of dull the experience comparatively. That's not to say this posh crossover isn't definitely worth the price of admission, however. Design is obviously subjective, so feel free to tell us that we need to get our eyes checked if you disagree. But dang, the Mercedes Maybach GLS is hard to look at. Most of the issues with the styling are on the front end, specifically the overuse of chrome in the grille and the absolutely gaudy lower vent openings with the same eye searing treatment. The Maybach GLS wears a variant of the traditional Mercedes front grille and bumper, but it ditches the embedded tripoint logo, because Maybach, and opts solely for bright vertical chrome slats instead. But it's the chrome vent inserts just below that draw the eye more immediately, and not in a good way. They don't mesh well with the GLS's overall design, especially the bright Designo Cardinal Red Paint, a $360 option. The Maybach-specific 23-inch wheels are extremely dope, to be fair. And the chrome window surrounds and roof rails aren't as offensive as that front end does, though why isn't the C-pillar trimmed like the B-pillar? The back end of the Maybach GLS is mostly clean, too, keeping the core GLS design elements intact. But you could still do without the wholly unnecessary chrome between the taillights and lower down on the bumper. Inside, the front compartment of the Maybach looks and feels a lot like a traditional GLS. The optional wood-trimmed steering wheel, $600, pinstriped black piano trim, $850, and a smattering of Maybach logos are the only visual differences between this luxed-up version and a well-equipped base model. Otherwise, the same basic layout from the GLS carries over untouched. Two 12.3-inch screens sit perched atop the dash, there's a touchpad controller within the center console, and the vent and dash styling go totally untouched.
Thanks for watching. Drop a like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to watch more videos like this. Twenty twenty one Toyota Prius Review Fading Fuel Sipper. But before we start, please support us by pressing the like and subscribe buttons, so that we can continue to provide information about car and motorcycle news. Also turn on the bell button to get the latest updates. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you. Just over 20 years ago, the Toyota Prius appeared in North America. No one, not Toyota, not the motoring press, not the general public, could have anticipated the impact that odd gas electric car was going to have. But two decades on and the rising popularity of crossovers, all electric vehicles, and all electric crossovers has taken the Prius from green car poster child to more of an afterthought. That just shouldn't be, though. Sure, it's weirdly styled, somewhat cramped, and an utter bore to drive, but the Prius can still sip fuel with the best of them. And with 2021 marking a big milestone, Toyota is celebrating the Prius 20th birthday with a new special edition trim, which features some flashy touches to complement its miserly fuel consumption and still comfy ride. There are more economical and cleaner products out there, but the Prius special edition proves it's still worth considering Toyota's breakout hybrid. Toyota's evolutionary approach between the second and third generation Prius went completely out the window when this car arrived back in 2015. Sharp, angry-eyed, and with solid haunches, it was like a teardrop with a bad attitude. We'll call the reaction to the squinty headlights and mean creases mixed while admitting that we kinda don't mind it. The Prius exterior is objectively ugly, but we're pleased that Toyota crafted a personality for its perennial snoozer. Our special edition tester adds to that expressive sheet metal with the usual gloss black touches automakers often reach for. You'll find dark elements on the wheels, mirror caps, front running light surrounds, and badging. The cabin, meanwhile, is where we take issue. Sure, you can argue that the center-mounted instrument cluster has become a Prius hallmark, but we'll continue to question why the damn thing can't just be in front of the driver. Center-mounted gauges thankfully lived a short life, aside from the Prius. The rest of the cabin is inoffensive enough with the usual high-quality Toyota switchgear and an over-reliance on shiny black plastic. Besides that, most of the materials feel solid and appropriate for the price. Toyota restrained itself in tweaking the Say's cabin, although we bet the product planner that came up with the 2020 edition, floor mats wished they devised something that didn't reference that dumpster fire of a year. Annoying dash layout aside, the Prius interior is a rather pleasant place. The seats, though boring to look at, offer ample support and long-haul comfort along with a surprisingly fun seating position. There's a serious amount of legroom, so despite the compact car size, there's little chance of brushing your knees against the dash or the low center console. In back, the Prius plunging roofline takes a big chunk out of second row headroom, while the car's 180-inch length means that 33.4 inches of legroom will have to do. But while a Hyundai Ioniq has substantially more legroom, 35.7 inches, your 6'2 author squeezed in and found the Prius back seats suitable for short hikes. Children and young teens should be perfectly happy on the cushy bench, then. While the Prius earns plaudits for its efficiency, it also makes efficient use of space. 
The cargo hold, which retains liftback access, offers 24.7 cubic feet of space or nearly double the 13.1 cubic feet available in the Corolla. That said, the Ionic, which is about 4 inches shorter, has more space with the seats up, at 26.5 cubes. Thanks for watching. Drop a like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to watch more videos like this.
2021 Volkswagen Tiguan Review, Highway Haven But before we start, please support us by pressing the like and subscribe buttons, so that we can continue to provide information about car and motorcycle news. Also turn on the bell button to get the latest updates. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you. A funny thing happened when the second-generation Volkswagen Tiguan went on sale, it was a hit. Oh sure, the Tiguan, a nonsense portmanteau of, we kid you not, Tiger, and, Iguana, is a bit player in the huge compact crossover segment, but when VW phased out the old model in 2017 and introduced the new model in 2018, sales went from 47,000 units to 103,000. Like we said, a hit. We didn't need 700 miles of highway driving to understand why consumers have bought over 100,000 Tiguans annually since that 2018 model year, but then Volkswagen invited us to a winter drive of the new Golf R in Michigan's Upper Peninsula and offered a 2021 Tiguan for the journey. Here's what we learned after driving up and down Interstate 75 for 9 hours in a range topping SEL Premium R line. The Tiguan is due for a refresh in 2022. But we only say that because it's what the calendar dictates. The current exterior is clean and attractive but isn't nearly as dull as the US spec Passat, while the cabin is a simple place chock full of high-quality materials and pleasant detailing, in contrast to the more expensive and simultaneously cheaper Atlas. The exterior's crisp, straight lines contrast with pleasant styling elements, such as the faux side grills on the front fender and the detailing in the LED headlights. Gloss black accents in the sporty front and rear fascia, exclusive to the R-Line trim, match neatly with our tester's pure white paint. That same trim includes flashy 20-inch wheels, a full inch larger than on the standard SEL. This is a nice crossover, with none of the polarizing flair present in the competition. That's neither a good or bad thing, but it is refreshing. Speaking of polarizing, the saffrono and black leather upholstery is, um, it's a look. The upholstery is vivid, almost lurid, like an overzealous mix of classic tan and red coloring, although it does broadly match the tin of saffron sitting in our spice rack. The color scheme the most eye-catching element in a cabin that relies on simple, logical design and high-quality materials instead of excessive tinsel. The thin-spoked, flat-bottom steering wheel, upright center stack, and conventional layout for the various climate controls are both unique in today's market and are easy to adjust to. Again, this is just a nice place to hang out. Driving a vehicle 700 miles means becoming intimately familiar with things like seat comfort and noise control. Thankfully, the Tiguan impresses on both counts. The front seats feel like they could have come from a GTI, offering up huge support via the thick side bolsters and ample adjustments. In particular, leg support is excellent and the seatback is so good we barely fiddled with the lumbar. There's plenty of padding too, so our stomach and bladder dictated when we stopped rather than a need to get out and stretch. Your author made the northerly trek alone, so the backseat's only occupants were a pair of muddy duck boots and a backpack. Still, throwing open those rear doors exposes plenty of legroom. With the driver's seat set for a 6'2 driver, the rear bench is a capacious place. Volkswagen quotes 38.7 inches of second row legroom which is a figure only a few vehicles in the class can beat. We're looking at you Honda CR-V and your 40.4 inches. And on the cargo front, our two-row Tiguan offers up 37.6 cubic feet with the seats in place and 73.5 with them folded. Both numbers upstage the otherwise roomy Honda.
Thanks for watching. Drop a like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to watch more videos like this. Twenty twenty one Ford Bronco Sport Badlands Review. But before we start, please support us by pressing the like and subscribe buttons, so that we can continue to provide information about car and motorcycle news. Also turn on the bell button to get the latest updates. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you. In September 2020, my wife and I took delivery of a Jeep Renegade Limited. This was not the original plan. We wanted the car pictured here, a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport Badlands. In a fit of optimism after the July debut, we got as far as submitting a pre-order and deposit before realizing six weeks later that a $450 monthly car payment made little sense with COVID keeping us indoors and working from home for the rest of time. We were right, as seven months later the Slate Blue Renegade we got for a song has a mere 3,000 miles on it. But after a week behind the wheel of the baby Bronco, our buyer's remorse is stronger than ever. For her, the Bronco was cuter. For me, it's everything else. The Sport Badlands, more even than the Outer Banks I reviewed in November, is packed with character and a joy to drive. It's capable, powerful, and for now, unique. In other words, it's a cure for the common crossover. The Bronco Sport has become an increasingly common sight on the roads of Metro Detroit, and it's easy to understand why the Motor City has taken to it so quickly. It's a boxy thing, with strong lines on the flat hood and slightly flared wheel arches working with a simple, two-box profile. The neat safari-style roof breaks up the profile and adds a dose of vintage Land Rover Discovery flair, while also amplifying cargo volume. While I'm reviewing the Badlands, this sport is technically a first edition, which is little more than a loaded Badlands with some trim tweaks, graphics, and gloss black wheels. I'm ambivalent on the black stickers, although they add a bit more variety to the Area 51 paint and black roof, and the first edition wheels are not the good ones. In the cabin, though, the first edition wears navy pier leather upholstery, which is otherwise only available on the three-cylinder outer banks. It's the main reason I won't begrudge any of the 2000 buyers for the limited edition option. I like the three upholstery choices on the Sport Badlands, but the blue leather and grey fabric feel more modern and refined. The bucking Bronco logo embossed on the seatbacks adds to that impression, although that touch is hardly exclusive to the first edition. There's a clear argument to make regarding the Bronco Sport's interior material quality. Plastic is abundant and it's harder than expected on a car that starts at nearly $30,000, particularly on the doors, around the climate vents, and on the center stack. But in a week of testing, I never heard a creak or a groan, or stumbled across a sharp piece of trim. This is hard plastic, and I wish Ford would do better, but at the very least it feels durable and well screwed together, rather than cheap and flimsy. The Bronco Sport features a cushy and supportive pair of front chairs with ample headroom and, on the driver's side, 8-way power adjustments. Heating is standard on both the Badlands and First Edition and proved a worthwhile feature on a few frosty mornings. The first edition adds a standard heated steering wheel, it's part of an option pack on the Badlands, while the seating position is excellent regardless of model, with solid fore, aft, and lateral sightlines.
Thanks for watching. Drop a like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to watch more videos like this.